Good morning, everyone, and uh, also those who are on Zoom, good morning to you as well. Good to see everybody here together, worshipping as we come before God in this post-Easter time. We begin our time of worship by singing the hymn number 297, Christ is Alive, Let Christians Sing. So we come before our God in prayer. Let us pray together. We've looked back on the time of the resurrection. We've gone through the Lenten period. And now we come into a different phase of Christ's witness. We reflect on all that has passed. And we look forward to all that is to come. All loving and all powerful God, we thank you for this day and the assurance that it brings that your love is stronger than anything else in heaven or in earth. Stronger than evil, stronger than human powers, stronger than sorrow and suffering, stronger than death itself. And we thank you that through your sacrifice, our world has seen so much pain and sorrow, yet you have shown that hope and faith is not in vain. O oh, loving and powerful God, accept our praise for all you've done in Christ, a mystery before which we stand in awe, a wonder in which we bow down in praise. Forgive us, Lord, for those times that we have failed you. We have heard your voice and been disobedient. We have not listened for your voice. We just ask, Lord, through the spirit of your risen life, that we may turn again to you, that we may hear your name calling us. Father, we pray that in this time that we share together, we will hear your voice. We will hear your voice and be obedient to it. For we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Those of you that were here a month or so ago might recall that I said I was going to do something 
that you've never seen me do before. Does anyone remember that? One or two? And what was it? Flowers. Flowers, absolutely. Well, um, I'm going to do something now that I have done before. So if you've heard this little talk, for young people mainly, but for all of us, I guess, if you've heard it before, I don't want anyone shouting out the answers. Is that all right? So one of the things that when I was a little boy that I always used to enjoy was magic, conjuring tricks. And my parents used to buy me every Christmas a box of tricks and off I'd go and every, I'd bore everyone silly by doing them. Well, I've got one trick that was always my favorite and I kept it and I thought, I think I can say something about Jesus through this trick, but I need some help. <laughs> do I need the screen? You don't need the screen. Only one. Come on, Eli. Here we go. All right. Now, what I've got is my finger. And I'm putting my finger in my fist. I'm going to take this handkerchief and I'm going to put it in my Right? Happy? Sure you're happy? I'm going to say to you, I'm counting three, and on three, I want you to blow on my fist. Can you do that? Don't need to practice, do you? Okay, let's go. One, two, three, go. <laughs> and the question that comes into perhaps some of your minds, those who don't know how to go, is how did he do that? How did he do that? It was there. And then it was gone. And I did that and posed that question because in our worship this morning, we're going to look at some of the people who saw Jesus alive once they'd seen him dead. You think about it. They'd seen him crucified. They'd seen him buried. And then blow me down, he's alive again. How did he do that? One of the reasons why we believe in Jesus' resurrection is because there were so many other people that saw him. His disciples, people walking along the road, individuals, all sorts of folk. And that account is available for us in the Bible. The story of how Jesus rose from the dead. And we all, we all, I'm pretty sure, believe that he did just that but the question I'd love to ask him and perhaps if I do make it to heaven I'm going to say to him how did you do that how did that happen and the answer at this stage is we don't know we don't know but we do know that it happened because there were so many people who witnessed it and saw it actually happen he rose from the dead. How did he do it? I don't know. But did he do it? Done right. So the last question is, how did I do that trick? Any offers? No? Then I shall leave you with the mystery. At least you've seen it done. I think the best thing we can do is sing another hymn. Um, oh, by the way, just because I can't keep secrets, do you want to know? I... All right, I'll tell you. Fake finger. And when I put that in there, put that in there, and I put it in the fake finger, and bingo, it's gone. It's <laughs> <different. laughs> let's, let's sing another hymn, this time number 295. Jesus is Lord of all the earth, he is King of creation.
people. God bless you as you go to your classes together. Now we're here to readings from God's Word. The first reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. On the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued, uh, continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day was almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. And our second reading is taken from John chapter 20, verses 10 to 18. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realise it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them what that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Those post-resurrection witnesses and testimonies 
to the risen Lord. Those two readings that we've just heard, you probably noticed that the men on the road to Emmaus didn't recognize Jesus. And Mary at the tomb didn't recognize Jesus. And yet something happened where the mist from their eyes was removed and they recognized him. Not disciples. Yes, Jesus appeared to the disciples, but it's these two stories that personally move me the most. They're lovely personal accounts and experiences. And if we look, first of all, at the men on the road to Emmaus, apparently it was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they were going along together, they were chatting and discussing what had happened in Jerusalem. How it was that this man Jesus had been crucified and how the story had come around that in fact he had risen from the dead. There's an interesting part in that reading where it says that the men did not recognize Jesus. It makes a point of that. They chatted together and they said, you know, do you know what's happened? Are you the only person in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's been going on? And Jesus, I love this in the reading with Jesus. Said, Jesus said, what things? What things? Jesus the prophet crucified. Some women went to the tomb, said the men. And Jesus starts to talk about himself about the coming of the Messiah, about the suffering, all of these things. And it's almost as though he's trying to give them a clue. Come on, come on, come on, who am I? But they don't recognize him. But they enjoy his company so much. They enjoy the teaching that he is giving to them so much that he says to them, they say to him, would you stay the night with us? We're calling by Come and have some food with us. And as they sat round the table, suddenly Jesus broke bread. And that did the trick. And suddenly they realized that the one that they've been walking with all this time, talking with all this time, who've been receiving clues about who he suddenly they realized. I like the expression when, when, that we read, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked, when he was with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us. Yes, up to that point, they were communicating with a stranger. But now, at the breaking of the bread, all was plain, just who it was that they were keeping company with. Lovely story. And they went back to the disciples and told them about it. And here is this build-up of information, confirmation that the story that Jesus had written was absolutely true. But come to another example, the one that we heard about Mary. Mary Magdalene is very prominent in the story of Easter and the resurrection. We heard on the first day of the week and on a dark morning, Mary Magdalene comes to an open tomb, a sad yet faithful visitor. And she is shocked to see that the stone to the tomb has been removed. What does she do? She runs to Simon Peter and John and says, they've taken the Lord. They've taken him from the tomb and I don't know where they have put him. And Peter and John came saw and they believed her story and went back leaving the weeping Mary alone or was she Peter and John had gone but Mary looked in the tomb and saw two angels who asked her what, why are you crying Mary they've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they put him and then, as the story progresses, somebody comes up behind her. Somebody comes up and says, woman, 
Why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Like the man on the road to Emmaus, she did not recognize Jesus. And she says, Sir, presuming he's the gardener, Sir, if you carry him away, tell, tell me where you put him, and I will get him. And then Jesus speaks one word. Now remember, the road to Emmaus, it was the breaking of bread that did the trick. With Mary, it was one word, and that one word was Mary. One word. She turns and says, you are my teacher. And I think it's a beautiful scene of this lady who's so faithful, who didn't recognize the one that she was looking for, finds that the light comes upon her when she hears her name, Mary. Jesus doesn't introduce himself. In the first case, it's what Jesus does that makes him known. In the second case, it's her name. And I've spent a little bit of time thinking about this, about the importance of a name. Have you ever considered your own name important? Do you know what your own name means? There is power in knowing the name of another person. 60 years ago, something like, I took the lady who became my wife round to meet my parents. Now my mum and dad were great people. And we went in and Anne was made tremendously welcome. We stayed there for about an hour, two hours chatting. And particularly between Anne and my mum, I could sense that there was a bond. And Anne kept saying, um, and Steve said this, and Steve said that, and Steve said something else, and all that. And look, it's me. I said, I'm on a winner here. <laughs> then my mum, bless her heart, looked at Anne, and Anne will tell you this is the truth. She said, she looked at me, she said, his name is Stephen, dear. We like to call him Stephen. And if you notice, when Anne talks about me, she usually calls me Stephen. But it was that moment that Anne said there was a bond drawn that my mother had said, his name is Stephen, dear. We like to call him Stephen. The power of that name, and it still exists today. I, I, I must share this one with you because there's somebody in this church that was involved in this story. And they and she will confirm it. We were downstairs having coffee a long time ago. And uh, surprise, surprise, I was going around to people, having a chat, you know, and, and Anne was over with someone else, you know, um, trying to catch my attention. But did I, did I pay any attention? No, no, too busy chatting. And I was told that there was one lady in particular who kept trying to catch my attention and kept calling over, Steve, Steve. Did he answer? No, he didn't. He's too, too busy talking. Steve, Steve. And Anne turned and said, and she said, let me help you. And she just turned towards me and said, Stephen. <laughs> and I, guess what? Yes. <laughs> that was you, wasn't it, Audrey? Do you remember that? It was Audrey that, that, that told that. You might not remember it, but I remember it. But why I share that with you is, it's the power of a name. You know, Stephen, I like Stephen when it's whispered softly. If it's spoken with a loud voice, you know, I know I'm in trouble. But you've all experienced that, I'm sure. You, you, you get a phone call. I get a telephone call and I pick it up and I hear the voice at the other end say, hello, Steve, this is Vic. Vic's my brother-in-law. I know exactly what that's going to happen. It's going to be a moan and a groan. And consequently, whenever I meet somebody named Vic, I'm anticipating that they're going to be miserable. And so he's not really miserable. It's just how he is. But the way in which a name has an impact and this wonderful, let's go back to Mary, this wonderful occasion that there she is. She's broken hearted. She, she can't find the one that she believes is dead. And she's talking to a gardener and he says, 
Mary. And it changes her life. With one word, it changes her life. And I've, like so many of us, I guess, looked back on times and thought, suppose we had been involved at that time. Suppose we had been one of the group looking, looking for Jesus because we'd heard that he was resurrected. What if, what if he spoke your name? What impact would that have on your life, on my life? You know, I've been examining my prayer life, and of course, when we come to prayers, we say, dear Lord, you know this, dear Lord, that, all of these things. And um, what if he, if I heard a voice and said, yes, Stephen, what impact would that have? Well, I'd like to feel it's the same impact that it had on Mary. I don't know, I, I, I picked up a book that um, I'd read a long, long time ago about called The Little World of Don Camillo. I don't know whether anyone's ever read it, but if you haven't, I, I'm going to advertise it shortly. But it's about, in Italy, about a Roman Catholic priest and the, the, the mayor who is a devout communist. And they're always clashing. They're always clashing. And in the book, the, 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 uh, Don Camillo, the actual priest, has got a crucifix at the back of his church. And he talks to the crucifix, and the crucifix talks back to him. And, you know, irreligious it might be, I don't care. It makes me laugh because it's done with such sensitivity. And there's lovely conversations between Don Camillo and Jesus. And uh, once when Papone, the mayor, is bowed down at the altar, and Don Camillo goes to the cross and the crucifix says, please, Lord, I'm going to kick you, I'm going to beat him up. And the, the cross speaks to him and says, no, no, Don Camillo, you're not going to do that. And it's that conversation. It's a humorous thing. And, uh, and if you ever see the book, it, it's well worth it. But it's this conversation of knowing names. What would be the power if we heard the name of Jesus? The, the voice of Jesus calling out Steve, Robert, uh, I'm looking over the ladies now, but it's Angela, you know. What if we heard the name of Jesus speaking to us? Would we experience that same thing as Mary experienced? She came into a deeper knowledge of the Lord. There's an old hymn that says, it's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Brother, sister, preacher, doesn't need to ask. He knows you by name he calls us that, that him jesus calls us out oh, the tumult of our lives while restless sea and day by day his sweet voice say, sounded saying christian for me what if we actually sang it and we put our own names in there i don't know we'd be daring enough to do that but i just want to share with you what i believe is a powerful message, and that powerful message is our name. When people talk about us, they say our name, and in our minds, something immediately clicks about the person. It's like those guys on the road to Emmaus, that they recognize Jesus by the breaking of bread and what he did. But Mary, Mary, she recognized Jesus because he knew and called her by her name. And I believe that experience is for us too, that there are those times in our prayers and our devotions where we somehow sense that Jesus is calling us by name. I'm going to suggest that we spend just a couple of minutes listening to a piece of music and during that piece of music, we just remain seated and contemplate the concept of Jesus calling you by name and the impact that it would have on you. Thank you.
we sing. We sing our next hymn, number 303. continue our time of worship as we bring our offerings together for the work of God in this church and circuit. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to bring our offerings to you. We come that they may be blessed and that they may be used wisely in carrying on your gospel message to those that have not yet known you. We thank you that you know each and every one of us by name. Bless us, we pray, as we bring these gifts of money, and gifts of our servants. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's come before God with our prayers of intercession. Father, we come before you with those matters that cause us concern in our world, cause us concern in our country, Cause us concern in our own lives. 
we're living through times that few of us understand. Financial times, economic times, times of strike, times of violence. Father, we come and confess that we haven't got the answers to bring about peace in this time. But we do have you and our faith. And we do believe in our hearts that when we turn to you and your purposes and your ways and the life of our Lord Jesus, then light comes out of the darkness. So, Father, for all of these situations that cause us concern, we pray that those who have the power to change things may do so. We pray that there may be justice for those who have faced injustice and the loss of loved ones through violence. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have had to witness to you. We, we bless you and praise you that we have seen our fellowship increase, not for the sake of numbers, but that your message can be more widely proclaimed. Thank you for our minister and his family. We pray for our stewards and officials. We pray for preachers and administrators. Lord grant that we may grow not just in number, but in spirit. That we may be a fellowship that is known for its love for others, for its care and companionship to so many others. We pray, Lord, for those known to us who are sick at this time, particularly for Mike and Mary Beth, just to ask your hand upon them and upon Amy. In the moment of quiet, let's remember others known to us personally who are in need of the Lord's healing hand. Rather, we pray for the young people of this church as they meet in our Sunday fellowship and in our worship, that they may catch that glimpse, that vision of what life is like to be your followers. We pray for them. We pray for those who teach them. We pray for those who bring any message of love and compassion to them. We thank you for all that they contribute in so many ways to this church family. May they grow in faith and proclaim your gospel in their own situations. Lord, we remember the story of Mary, who recognized you through the simple utterance of her name. We ask, Lord, that we may get into that habit of knowing that you know each and every one of us by name. You know each and every one of us intimately. The things that cause us concern, the things that bring us joy. Friends and family. Lord, we pray. We pray for all of them. We pray that we may all grow closer to you. So, Lord, hear these prayers that we bring. Bless this fellowship that we have enjoyed. For we ask it in and through the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray.
Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son. Endless is the victory, thou or death hast won. We share in hymn number 313. Be the glory, conquering son. Bless us, we pray, as we go from this place, that we may serve you more faithfully. For we ask this and your blessing in the precious name of Christ our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Amen.